I started making movies at a time when women were greatly discouraged from directing and as a matter of fact given almost no opportunities to do so. And I remember one executive saying to me, uh, feature films are expensive to make and expensive to market and women directors are one more problem we don't need. So that was the general attitude of the time. And Ray saw me flailing around and he got very angry and he said, well, you may or may not be able to do this, but you sure deserve a chance to try. I knew about Yekel, which was written by Abraham Kahn, the great editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, who had written uh, about five stories. I thought the story was just wonderful, but probably without even thinking, and this may be the way screenwriters work on other people's material. I don't know. You, you, you see it your own way. And although in the original story it was essentially the husband's story and what happens to him, when I read it what interested me most was what happened to the wife. The hard part about casting Jake. I cannot tell you the number of actors I met who said, oh, he seems so, mm, he, isn't, he isn't very nice, he isn't very this. I wanted him to be who he was, a guy who, who had been a blacksmith in the old country, who'd come here, who was suddenly an earner, who felt himself to be an attractive, physical American, a Yankee, and, and all the excitement that went with it. And I, I really didn't want to sweeten his character up because I felt what he did to his wife is what he did. Stephen Keats came in for an audition and he had no trouble at all with the dark sides of the character. As a matter of fact, he understood it right away and he wanted to do it. Doris Roberts for Mrs. Kavarsky. Doris was one of the most experienced actors of the bunch. And it was a pleasure to be working with someone who, who knew as much as she did and had been around the block a few times, you know, had, had much more of a sense of what the whole thing was about. Just before we were ready to start, the actor playing uh, Mr. Bernstein, the boarder, dropped out. I guess he got something better that he wanted to do in California, and he left. And of course, I was frantic because I think we had, it was over a weekend of Labor Day, and we were going to start the Tuesday after that. And I, my, uh, I was telling my cinematographer, Ken Van Sickle, that I was really a wreck. I didn't know what to do. And he said, well, what about Mel Howard? I said, Mel Howard? He said, well, when he came in, you told me that you liked the way he looked and you'd like to find a, a boarder who would look like that. And I said, but Mel Howard isn't an actor. Mel Howard came in for a crew part. So he said, well, if, I said, okay, okay, okay. And I brought Mel in. And of course, Mel grew up in a Lubavitcher home, spoke Yiddish, uh, although he hadn't acted before. He was fantastic. So it was another lucky thing that happened for Hester Street. Steve Atha was the, did the hair in the, and beautifully in, in the film, and he was also in charge of the makeup, and, or supervising the makeup, and came in to see me, and he said, uh, we have a problem. Doris Roberts wants to wear her false eyelashes, and I said, well, tell her to take them off. And he said, well, of course I told her to take them off, but she won't do it. She said she always wears her false eyelashes, she's worn them in everything she's ever done, and she's not going to change now. So I stomped back there, and I said, Doris, this takes place in 1896. People didn't have false eyelashes like this in 1896. She said, oh, and then she took. And at that moment, I realized the power of the director. You know? <laughs> I grew up in Omaha and saw films as a child. And then I got married when I was 21, and Ray and I moved to Cleveland and there was an art theater there called the Heights Art Theater, and it showed the movies of Satya Ajit Ray, and they had just a fantastic influence on me because what he let happen was he let the characters tell the story. And I remember watching his, just, just being overwhelmed by the, the beauty of those black and white films. They were just a, a gorgeous, the Apu trilogy had come out at that time, and I think I had that in mind as well, how, how phenomenal that those films were and how, how, how much the story came through. So I think I felt that that was the right thing for the story and that's what I wanted to do. So I wrote the screenplay and uh, the question of black and white or color came along and I guess because I was very influenced by the research that I did, the stories, the uh, photographs that were in the public library by Jacob Rees and the great photos by Roman Vishniak of, 
uh, Polish Jews between the wars. And it, it, they made such an impact on my imagination, I guess I began to think of the film in black and white. The question of the language was also one that I realized, looking back on it, was probably not the the, the, the most commercial decision, but one I made anyway. My father it was 12 when he came over, and he had lots of memories of problems that he had with the language and of mangling the language and of leaving something on a bus once and having somebody tell him and not being able to understand what the man was saying and leaving and then realizing that it was gone on the bus. And so I just felt that it was such a crucial part of an immigrant experience that I couldn't leave it out. Ken was my film school, by the way. You know, I was when I finally got started making films. I think I was thought I was too old to go to film school. I wanted to get started. I waited long enough, and I, I, when Ken and I met each other, we just hit it off right away. And he, when he shot the first short, he made a little light box, and he put the lights all in different places, and he would show me what would happen. He'd say, "Now, if the character moves from here," and then he would move the lights in this little. And he, it was like the best education in the world. He also had the nicest way of, I'd say, Ken, Ken, let's put the camera here and do this and that. And he'd say, we could do that, but we could also put it here and do this and this. And I would, of course, understand that that was the better idea, but he never put me down or made me feel, you know. <laughs> the most difficult of all of the sets was the outdoor set of Hester Street. <clears throat> and that we did that on Seventh Avenue, <clears throat> excuse me, on Morton's. We did that on Morton Street between Seventh Avenue South, and I can't remember what the other end was. But the reason we did it that way is that it came to a T. So although we could never shoot in the back direction, we could shoot this way because it didn't go on and on and on and on. It, the, the street, other street, blocked it, so we only had to do this street and as much as the eye could see of this street. Um, we needed that for four and a half days, and. We did not have the money to pay crew to dismantle the street and to put it up again. So we uh, covered it up and had a man sit there all night with it. And, you know, nothing happened. But I think today, if it, what if it had rained? <laughs> you know, I could have. <laughs> I mean, why not? Um, or, or somebody had, you know, come over and tried to disrupt the set or tried to take things from it or something, but it didn't happen. One of the things I'd like to, to mention is the horse. Although it appears in Hester Street that there are many horses, in fact, there was one horse. And that is because the horses earn more than the actors. You had to pay for the horse, and you had to pay for a teamster for the horse, and a handler, and a this and a that. And it, anyway, it was a lot. So uh, I, we had the idea to take one horse, a white horse, and to paint him. And we painted him with water-soluble paints. And we had a lovely Italian craftsman who was on the art uh, team and he would just sit there, you know, just painting the horse, and the horse liked it, you know. And you'd send him up, and he looked like he was pied, and then you'd send him back, and he looked like he had, he was all black, and the next time he went, he was white. And so, a as you look, you're going to see that that horse did <laughs> a lot of work on that movie. I tell you something that made a big effect on me. There were two women who preceded me as directors whose work I cared about. One was Shirley Clark, who did uh, Portrait of Jason. She did The Cool World. She's a wonderful director. And Barbara Loden. And Barbara Loden and I became friends. Barbara Loden uh, directed Wanda, a wonderful movie that she was in. She's a wonderful actress. And when it came time and I had a rough cut, I said to Barbara, who was married to Kazan at the time, do you think he would take a look at it? And she said, yes, I do. So she brought him in to see it. And he said as follows. He said, it's wonderful. I just love it. But it's, it, it make the first part shorter. The story starts when the wife comes. So I said, well, but I, I've already made the first part shorter. And he said, make it even shorter. So I said, OK. So it's, it's, I think uh, I had had about 40 minutes of film before the wife came. And it's now down to about 20 minutes of film before the wife came. And of course, he's right. He was absolutely right. And I don't think I lost a thing. The music is something that I feel especially good about, and with all the films I've done, I, I would put this in my top pantheon of scores for my films. And it came about in an odd way. I had met with a number of composers, and their general idea was cello themes in A minor. 
and uh, in other words, stuff that seemed, you know, uh, heavy Jewish kind of music. And I ran into Steve Keats one day on the street, and he said, how's it going? And I said, well, everything's fine, but I can't find a composer. And he said, what are you looking for? And I told him the problem. He said, well, what would you really like to have? And I said, I'd like to have them hear the music that they would have heard if they passed a bandstand on a, a Saturday night. I'd like to see what was this world that they all were so happy to be in, so eager, so afraid of, so, so this and that. So he recommended Billy Balcom. William Balcom has since become a, a very prominent, uh, fine composer, composer especially of operas. And Steve somehow knew him, and uh, Bill and I got together, and he said, well, I told him this about the bandstand on a Saturday night, who they might hear, and he said, he brought Jerry Schwartz, who was the first trumpet of the New York Philharmonic, over to my house, and we sat in the living room, and they played through the oeuvre of Herbert C. Clark. Herbert C. Clark was a bandmaster and had actually played in Seuss's band. I, I think he was first something or other. And he, he was a cornetist. He was first cornet. That's it. And Jerry Schwartz played the cornet and Billy played the piano. And they simply played through. And I told them which things I liked and which things I, and so on. And I can still see that there was a big... Uh, a newspaper on the ground and he kept shaking the cornet out as you have to do when you play that kind of instrument and it, I just remember it as one of the loveliest days I ever spent in my life of course I knew I had the music and the music was just wonderful and to have people of that caliber making it for you so a after I picked some then they recorded it to the picture after I completed the film and you know we thought the film was pretty good <laughs> Um, we couldn't find a distributor, and I spent we spent about six months trying to find someone who would do it. And the most that we ever had offered was somebody said to us, "Put it out on 16 millimeter on the synagogue circuit," and that you know Ray just couldn't stand that. That really made him mad, you know, because he thought the film had tremendous potential. But there was a six month period where I thought I'd made a movie that couldn't be distributed. And I got to tell you, that was you know we a lot of people had put money in it and. And also just my own artistic <laughs> vanity. I mean, I didn't want to think I'd made a movie that couldn't get distribution. But I remember the day that the film opened. It opened at the, the Plaza Theater. And I had heard that what you want when your film opens is you don't want it to be bad weather because people stay home. But you don't want it to be really good weather because people don't want to go to the movie. So what you want is a sort of a so-so grayish day. So they say, oh, let's go to the movie. So we woke up, and there was a storm like you would not believe. And Ray said to me, I'm not going down there. I said, okay, me either. He said, I'm going to watch a football game. I said, okay, okay, you know, because we felt that was awfully bad for the film. And then we got a call from one of the people that was working for Ray, and he said, you should come down here. So we went down, and there was this line around the block, and all the people with umbrellas standing there in the rain, unbelievable. And I, Carol Kane's mother took a picture of the people with the umbrellas, so I know this isn't an imagination. You know, I know that it happened. That was great. We, You know, we had a fantastic review in the New York Times <clears throat> and that was a big help. <laughs> I, th I just think it was a lucky film. It was just lucky in a lot of ways. It was lucky the people who worked on it, the people who were in it, the weather. <laughs> because I think we had, it was over a weekend of Labor Day and we were going to start the Tuesday after that. And I, my, uh, I was telling my cinematographer, Ken Van Sickle, that I was really a wreck. I didn't know what to do. And he said, well, what about Mel Howard? I said, Mel Howard? He said, well, when he came in, you told me that you liked the way he looked and you'd like to find a, a boarder who would look like that. And I said, but Mel Howard isn't an actor. Mel Howard came in for a crew part. So he said, well, if I said, okay, okay, okay. And I brought Mel in. And of course, Mel grew up in a Lubavitcher home, spoke Yiddish, uh, although he hadn't acted before. He was fantastic. So it was another lucky thing that happened for Hester Street. Steve Atha was the, did the hair in the, and beautifully in, in the film. 
and he was also in charge of the makeup and or supervising the makeup and came in to see me and he said uh, we have a problem Doris Roberts wants to wear her false eyelashes and I said well tell her to take them off and he said well of course I told her to take them off but she won't do it she said she always wears her false eyelashes she's worn them in everything she's ever done and she's not going to change now so I stopped back there and I said Doris this takes place in 1896 people didn't have false eyelashes like this in 1896 she said oh and then she took and at that moment, I realized the power of the director. You know? <laughs> I grew up in Omaha and saw films as a child. And then I got married when I was 21, and Ray and I moved to Cleveland. And there was an art theater there called the Heights Art Theater. And it showed the movies of Satya Ajit Ray. And they had just a fantastic influence on me because what he let happen was he let the characters tell the story. And I remember watching his, th just, just being overwhelmed by, by the, the beauty of those black and white films. They were just a, a gorgeous, the Apu trilogy had come out at that time. And I think I had that in mind as well, how, how phenomenal that those films were and how, how, how much the story came through. So I think I felt that that was the right thing for the story and that's what I wanted to do. So. I wrote the screenplay, and uh, the question of black and white or color came along, and I guess because I was very influenced by the research that I did, the stories, the uh, photographs that were in the public library by Jacob Rees, and the great photos by Roman Vishniak of uh, Polish Jews between the wars, and it, it, they made such an impact on my imagination, I guess I began to think of the film in black and white. The question of the language was also one that I realized, looking back on it, was probably not the, 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 the most commercial decision, but one I made anyway. My father had, was 12 when he came over, and he had lots of memories of problems that he had with the language and of mangling the language and of leaving something on a bus once and having somebody tell him and not being able to understand what the man was saying and leaving and then realizing that it was gone on the bus. and. So I just felt that it was such a crucial part of an immigrant experience that I couldn't leave it out. Ken was my film school, by the way. You know, I went to the wife. The hard part about casting Jake, I cannot tell you the number of actors I met who said, oh, he seems so, mm, he, isn't, he isn't very nice, he isn't very this. I wanted him to be who he was. A guy who, who had been a blacksmith in the old country, who'd come here, who was suddenly an earner, who felt himself to be an attractive, physical American, a Yankee, and, and all the excitement that went with it. And I, I really didn't want to sweeten his character up because I felt what he did to his wife is what he did. Stephen Keats came in for an audition, and he had no trouble at all with the dark sides of the character. As a matter of fact, he understood it right away, and he wanted to do it. Doris Roberts for Mrs. Kavarsky. Doris is one of the most experienced actors of the bunch. And it was a pleasure to be working with someone who, who knew as much as she did and had been around the block a few times, you know, had, had much more of a sense of what the whole thing was about. Just before we were ready to start, the actor playing uh, Mr. Bernstein, the border, dropped out. And I guess he got something better that he wanted to do in California, and he left, and of course I was frantic. I started making movies at a time when women were greatly discouraged from directing and, as a matter of fact, given almost no opportunities to do so. And I remember one executive saying to me, uh, feature films are expensive to make and expensive to market, and women directors are one more problem we don't need. So that was the general attitude of the time. And Ray saw me flailing around, and he got very angry, and he said, well, you may or may not be able to do this, but you sure deserve a chance to try. I knew about Yekel, which was written by Abraham Kahn, the great editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, who had written uh, about five stories. I thought the story was just wonderful, but probably without even thinking, and this may be the way screenwriters work on other people's material. I don't know. You, you, you see it your own way. and. Although in the original story, it was essentially the husband's story and what happens to him. When I read it, what interested me most was what happened.